um, we have uh, uh, Riley Drake's gonna be presenting on uh, work that she's doing in Fort Stanton, Cape, New Mexico, which is a very major system down there. So, Riley, are you on the call right now? Can you hear us? Yes, I am. <laughs> Before we get started, anyone who's not presenting, please mute. Let's try and eliminate the background noise. Okay. Joe, if people are having trouble muting, can't you just mute people yourself? Yes, that's true. Thank you. <laughs> Do you need sharing screen abilities, Riley? You're on mute right now. I'm working Riley. on it. Okay. Working. Participant sharing has been enabled. Okay, great. Can everyone hear and see me? Yes. Yep. Okay, wonderful. Okay, thank you. Um, so I am uh, Riley Drake, as, as Alex introduced me. I'm excited to be talking to you all tonight about some of the microbiological um, and physical exploration that we've been doing in Fort Stanton Cave um, for the last uh, three or so years. So, um, I am, uh, so just to start, I guess these are both pictures in Fort Stanton Cave. Um, one of these is uh, Snowy Springs, um, which is sort of where the, uh, there's like a calcite tube that we crawled into and surveyed and sampled. And then the other is in scorched earth where there's a lot of like uh, velvet deposition. Yeah, um, and I got a great introduction from Alex, but um, just, uh, since I'm, I'm still relatively new, um, I am currently a PhD student at Emory. Um, however, this uh, research is actually related to uh, work that I had done in the past. Um, and uh, I led an expedition to Alaska last summer and I've been involved with some cave leadership organizations uh, and that's taken me a lot of cool places. And one of those was Fort Stanton Cape. Um, while I was at MIT, I got to do a lot of field work. Um, our lab had inv invented a, a particular technique that was broadly applicable. So I got sent a lot of places um, at, from uh, near to far. Um, and uh, I was pretty used to this idea where you have the molecular biology set up in a lab and then you pack your lab in a suitcase and you assemble it somewhere else. That, that felt pretty normal to me um, a couple years into working in the lab at MIT. Um, and so one day I thought about uh, what if I studied microbiology in a cave? Um, I knew that the microbiome affected sort of human health and uh, humans are sort of an ecosystem. So I wondered what about the ecosystem of caves? Um, and what, uh, what, what, micro what microbes live there um, and why? Uh, and here are some pictures of some of the earlier cave uh, microbiology experiments that I did. Um, I did seven pilot experiments in the Northeast before going out to, to South Dakota. And then I sampled wind and dual cave in South Dakota, as well as Reed's cave. Um, and finally, I ended up later at Fort Stanton Cave. So one of the reasons that I was interested in cave microbiology was uh, the sort of growing importance of groundwater. So as uh, global climate change occurs, uh, aquifers will probably continue to deplete and become dysregulated. And 40 estimates range, but 40 to 60% of drinking water in the United States comes from karst aquifers. So understanding uh, karst aquifers in, in terms of not only their level, but what lives in them and, and how can we 
predict and understand disruptions um, is very important. So as I mentioned before, the cave ecosystems, in addition to the aquifers, um, are vulnerable to climate change. Um, but we also find a number of extremophilic bacteria um, with alternative metabolisms that might contain solutions uh, to waste management problems. Uh, and shown here is uh, two of the people on the Fort Stanton Microbial Project, um, John and Emily. Um, and as a backup, uh, one, of, one of our sampling strategies was this uh, filter, the sterile filter, and we collected the microbes off the sterile filter. And one of the questions that you might have um, is, what does cave exploration have to do with microbiological research? So you have cave explorers, they go run, they do exciting things, uh, they draw maps, um, and then you have cave microbiologists and sort of why, why do I feel like these two are connected? Um, so one of the reasons that there's not so many cave researchers or that caves are hidden and they're difficult to access, as you all know, um, and the other reason is that a lot of caves don't have amazing maps um, or continued work on them. Um, so in order to sort of understand the cave microbiome and the cave microbiology and how it interacts with the cave itself and the organisms that live in the cave, um, we have to understand what's there. Um, and we also need to know exactly where. Um, and that, that sort of helps us try to build a more comprehensive picture of the cave from both microbiology and geology. Um, and that's a picture of John taking a sample of manganese in Fort Stanton Cave. Um, one thing I should clarify is that um, what, uh, what I'll be describing studying is, uh, is cave accessible groundwater. Caves don't necessarily have aquifers in them, but there are places in caves sometimes where you could access the groundwater, which is either an aquifer uh, proper or uh, more often maybe like a perched aquifer. Um, where it is, it shares water uh, with the aquifer, but it's not necessarily the aquifer itself. Um, so the first, so this is Fort Stanton Cave. It's in New Mexico. Um, and this is what Fort Stanton Cave is well known for. So it's a major system. At this point, it's about 43 miles long. Uh, but the most the coolest part, in my in my opinion, and I think I think many people share this, of Fort Stanton Cave is this thing called Snowy River. So Snowy River is a formation that's hypothesized to be 1,200 years old, which is very young, um, and it's a calcite river that continues for I think at at last mapping estimate 15 miles, um, which is absolutely wild. It's very cool, um, and not only is it cool to see, it's uh, sort of the, the subject of continued scientific debate as to why it's there and nowhere else. Um, and every year the uh, that we've monitored it, uh, the sort of uh, water will flow across Snowy River and will deposit more calcite on the river. Um, so it's an actively forming formation. Um, and there are many um, steps that we have to take in order to prevent damaging it. You might notice in, uh, in this photo, we look a little bit strange. We've all got these like soft soled shoes on um, so that we don't mark up the formation with, a, with the skid marks of our shoes. And it's a little bit hard to tell in this photo, but uh, all our packs are packed very round because in places where we need to crawl, we, ro we roll them across the formation um, because dragging them uh, would again uh, prevent that, like promote that damage. And also to the packs, um, the calcite is very rough. Uh, and then finally, uh, exploration in Fort Stanton Cave is um, involves a lot of changing your clothes. Um, you can see in this photo, um, which is why I picked it, there's that very clean white spot of the calcite of Snowy River. And then a lot of the rest of the cave is covered with mud and manganese. So to avoid uh, these two interacting, uh, we have uh, changing areas where you'll change from your clean to your dirty and your dirty to your clean clothes. And you'll put on and take off an entire set of clothes every time you do that. Um, so I've actually been practicing in my apartment changing clothes, which is a strange thing to, to train for caving, but that's that's how it is. Um, and then in Fort Stanton Cave, it's warm and windy. Uh, it's generally, it has very well decorated areas and parts um, with the most prominent decoration of being being the river. Um, and then it's, it's mostly dry. Uh, and that's besides the, the river flows every, about every year, sometimes it flows for several years. Uh, but once it finishes flowing, uh, it dries up. And that's 
that's the only time that we can explore uh, the Snowy River uh, Passage in Fort Stanton Cave. Um, so uh, there were some research questions that I sort of started with when I was thinking about how I wanted to go about investigating the microbes in Fort Stanton Cave. I think, uh, so I will just, I'll explain a little bit about uh, what brought me to these questions. So the first one is what lives in the cave? Um, the second one is how does it live here, there? What is the community eating? And what do the individual bacteria eat? Um, and the reason I asked that question is because I wanted to understand the, the bacterial metabolism to understand the what the third question is, the resources that are available in the cave, and maybe make some predictions, though not like conclusions about how environments in the cave are connected. And uh, finally, uh, working, I've been working with the Fort Stanton Cave Study Project and the Bureau of Land Management um, with this idea that we could maybe monitor the microbes in the cave if we get a baseline set of data to understand environmental disruptions and, and sort of predict risks to the cave before they're, they're major. Um, and the, the, one of the sort of reasons I got this idea takes us back to Massachusetts in Dolo Cave. Um, and, and this is just a very simple experiment that I did um, a couple years ago. Um, was I wanted, I wanted like a very basic idea, uh, like model system for um, environmental disruption uh, and, and how that might affect uh, the microbial ecosystem. So one of my friends mentioned that they were in a cave. Uh, I think they were trying to survey it at the time and they were recollecting that one of their friends had stepped on the moon milk and it was previously pristine moon milk. And I, I was like, huh, that'd be interesting. That's, that's a shame, but maybe I should go and find that exact boot, boot print in the moon milk and see how it changed the composition. And so I did just that. I gathered up my friends, David and Bo on, on Saturday morning, um, and we took our sterile sampling supplies into the cave and we sampled the boot print area, um, which had been stepped on about a year previous. And then we sampled the pristine area, which had not been stepped on. And to our surprise, is that cut off for you as well at the top? No. Okay. Um, yeah. It is? Okay. Bummer. Let's see. Does that make it better? Yes. Uh, okay. Thank you. Okay. Better. Good to know now. Is it still cut off there? Hmm. Hmm. Okay. Okay. Maybe that's just that slide. Sorry. Um, okay. So uh, what we found was pretty surprising to me, actually, that we had an entire phylum of bacteria that existed in undisturbed moon milk that just went away after a year of being stepped on, um, uh, sort of highlighted here. Um, and that sort of, that, that got me thinking that maybe it wouldn't be totally unreasonable to monitor changes in environment by looking at the bacteria in the environment. And uh, part of that is that bacteria are very, uh, very versatile in their metabolism. Um, so when you see the bacteria that are, for example, oil eating bacteria, you might be able to infer that there is now oil in that environment. Um, and then we're back to Fort Staten Cave and we're going to talk a little bit more about the research there. So uh, before I talk about my results at all, I want to be, uh, you might notice something about me, uh, which is that I don't live in New Mexico. And so it's a little weird to do research in New Mexico. Um, and the reason that I've been able to do that is incredible support. Um, from the Fort Staten Cave Study Project um, and the Bureau of Land Management, both financially and logistically. I've gotten people to take samples for me as soon as uh, Snowy River dries up um, and before it floods for the season. And that's been incredibly, incredibly helpful. Uh, shown here is Steve Pierman, uh, the previous president of the Fort Staten Cave Study Project, um, taking a sample, a microbial sample of one of the end feeders um, to the cave. Um, so I, could not have done it without any of any of these groups um, and I'm very thankful for their support. So in terms of those questions that I asked before, uh, I wanted to talk briefly about the experimental approaches that I would take to uh, address these. So what lives in the cave? I showed you before uh, the 16S RNA sequencing is sort of uh, very cool actually. The uh, bacterial genomes have this barcode. Um, there's a region that's highly variable between 
many bacteria species, but it exists in most bacterial species. Um, and so we can use that barcode to identify known species of bacteria, and we call that that 16S region. Um, and then to understand what the community is eating, um, we do uh, sequencing of the entire DNA. Uh, the DNA represents all the things that the bacteria could eat. Um, and then we also look at the RNA. So if DNA is like a book uh, that represents all the possible things that a, that a cell can do, um, the RNA is sort of like what it's reading right now. The RNA might not necessarily correlate to a protein, but it also, it could be messages within the cell or messages to other cells. And then the sort of moonshot question was what are the individual bacteria eating? Um, and I accomplished that by single cell RNA sequencing, which I'll talk a little bit about in a, a bit, but single cell RNA sequencing is that RNA sequencing idea. What is the organism doing right now, but reduced to a single um, bacterial cell? Um, and then uh, by taking all of that sequence, sorry? Here. Okay, uh, by taking all of that sequencing data together, um, I wanted to analyze the, what are the metabolic resources in the cave um, and how are the, not how are the environments in the cave connected because that's pretty well hypothesized, but sort of see if we could confirm existing hypotheses about uh, connections specifically between cave water um, within the cave and uh, understanding how the cave community is both in the water and um, in the manganese uh, deposits in the cave change over time. Uh, and these were not my ideas per se. Um, there's been some great work by uh, students of uh, Dr. Penelope Boston um, and Mike Slide uh, at the University of New Mexico, um, and before by Kyle Uckert, who worked with NASA to look at the manganese deposits. So I didn't come up with these ideas. I was just really interested in, in trying to figure out what was happening. So in the lab, we have some RNA degrades really fast. And um, DNA can also degrade if you don't keep it cold. Uh, so that, that presented some interesting problems uh, doing, so in RNA research, you wanna keep it cold. As you can see, this is a very old map. This is from 2014 of Fort Stanton Cave, but um, this sort of shows the river along which I took these samples. As you can see, some of the, the sites are miles and miles apart and miles from the entrance. Uh, so keeping everything cold was not an option. And we ended up, uh, I ended, we ended up testing a number of different preservatives to try to figure out what preservative would best um, keep the community composition of the DNA um, as close to what it was when we sampled, as well as prevent the RNA from degrading. The second thing is to be really clean and to, to sort of overcome this. Uh, uh, we made a very rigorous sampling protocol where we were doing exactly the same thing every time, changing gloves in the same way, using sterile gloves, using sterile everything. Um, and also taking preparation controls. So taking a sample in the cave where you sample nothing um, and comparing that to see what might what contaminants uh, might have been introduced in the extraction process and in the amplification process. And then the third thing um, is extracting DNA and RNA as soon as you can, leaving these things to sit, especially at room temperature, um, changes their composition. Um, there's a, a small experiment I did with the moon milk samples here, um, and you can see the bars, which represent different types of bacteria change in composition if you, if you leave it sitting out. So we tried very hard to not leave it sitting out. Uh, another unforeseen complication is that metals, we were sampling uh, metal deposits, inhibit the extraction of genetic material. So that was sort of a summer of troubleshooting, to be honest, um, to try to get the DNA out of the samples of, of the metal deposits that we were looking at. So question one, what lives in the cave? Um, here I have some long read sequencing data um, and we identified some uh, genus, geni of um, different bacterial species that live in the cave. Um, this is one of the earliest experiments we did. Um, and it seems to be pretty consistent that we have some uh, larger population of, of bacterial species and a little bit more of a complex community that lives uh, in the water that we collected in the cave. And then in the manganese, we have a more sparse community that seems uh, to be more extremophiles uh, and uh, a little bit more varied in their, in their, in their metabolic strategies. Um, and how does it live there? So, here I am showing uh, Turtle Junction, which is sort of, it's about two miles from the end of the cave um, and Crystal Creek, which is the, the sump of the cave. Um, and 
one of the things that I was interested in looking at was uh, how might the bacterial communities change as they're carried by water throughout the cave. And as as you can see, it's pretty diverse in both both um, both of these. Uh, you have a large number of proteobacteria in both cases, um, but you have uh, the metho you you lose a bunch of of bacteria in that last mile. Um, and, and Crystal Creek also has a surface spring, so it's hypothesized that there's some sort of crosstalk between the Rio Benito, which is a surface river. Um, and that, that Crystal Creek sump, that there is some mixing of that. Um, but uh, there are some, this is a thermophile that I'll talk about in a second, um, but there are a number of uh, genii and species that are, that are um, lost as the travel through the cave occurs. Um, and cave environments are, are interesting because they're, they're dark and uh, they don't usually have a lot of energy sources because they're dark and there's no sunlight, which tends to be the, the basis of, of most pyramids of, of, of life and energy. And uh, sort of consistent with what I've seen in other, other cave environments, specifically wind cave, we see a lot of bacteria that are um, uh, eating rocks, uh, which is lithotrophic, um, and eating each other also, which I don't have a fancy name for. And uh, to talk briefly about something that's a little bit uh, complicated but very neat, I think, um, is uh, this idea that the single cells that exist in nature um, in a specific what we call transcriptomic state, so a state of activity and a state of metabolism, instead of taking cells in a lab and poking them, you can isolate single cells as they exist in nature and profile their expression of different genes um, and then understand how they might relate together and, and we call that like maybe community structure um, or maybe like a, a network of metabolism but that would be kind of the dream for for trying to sort of probe how these bacterial communities actually exist not just the species that are in there but what are they actually doing um, one uh, thing they could be doing is just starving and, and hanging out um, and, and so I was curious uh, which species specifically were uh, metabolically active and that, that was one of the major reasons that I wanted to do the single cell RNA sequencing. So in the Shalik lab, um, I was fortunate enough that uh, my former boss allowed me to develop a technology that we had uh, developed in the lab uh, further for sequencing in a cave. Um, this is uh, briefly, we took a, a plastic uh, PDMS array, so a plastic uh, array with a bunch of holes in it, and we put some chitosan on the surface, and then we put beads that captured RNA into the holes, and then we put the cells from the cave into those holes, on top of that, into the holes, and then we sealed with a membrane. And the membrane sealing is a process that occurred at exactly 30, about 37 degrees. Um, so we were able to, after many rounds of optimization, load the beads and load the beads before we went into the cave, load the cells when we were in the cave so that the, the RNA was captured before it degraded um, and then seal with the membrane. Uh, and uh, in early iterations, we tried to like seal it with the membrane under the armpit, uh, which worked mostly actually, um, as opposed to bringing in a large electronic device, which would be probably unallowed. Um, and we found that the single cell genomes were Interesting, but very sparse by themselves. We had only a couple hundred to a couple thousand base pairs. Um, and one of the students uh, at the Shalik Lab, Sarah Nyquist and I, uh, were able to use these uh, use these very small snippets of genetic information that we knew were from one cell um, to uh, clarify the metagenomic strategy. So this is the genomic assembly al alone. So if you took all of the bacteria and you put them in a blender and you tried later to sort out which uh, transcripts came from which bacteria, it looks like this. Um, and with the introduction of the single cell genomes, which were not that much data, we were able to clarify that and, and make more distinct categories of metabolism. Um, and I guess this is, how does it live there? Uh, I said before dynamically, um, and I wanted to go into a couple interesting metabolic strategies that we've seen. Um, so the methopyrus, uh, Candlery, which we saw kind of in the middle of the cave, but not at the end of the cave, 
um, requires a high ionic concentration to grow and proliferate. Um, and that might be consistent with the supersaturated calcite waters that flow over the surface of the river to deposit a new layer on Snowy River roughly every year. Um, and then we have the hydrophilus thermoluteos, <laughs> sorry. Uh, and uh, that's another chemolithoautotroph. So it's, it's able to extract its own energy uh, from rocks and chemicals. And then we have uh, another example is the acidophyllum cryptum. So that that uh, is an acid loving bacteria um, and it's been written about because it's capable of producing electricity for biological waste. So this is just a snapshot. It's not necessarily the overwhelming uh, trends that we're seeing. The overwhelming trends that we're seeing are a combination of sort of run of the mill lithotrophic bacteria that are eating the rocks and hanging out. Um, some other bacteria that are eating the bacteria that are eating the rocks. That's generally the interaction that I've observed so far, but that's still ongoing. Um, and one of the interesting things that I found uh, was so far was that uh, in the analysis of our data was that the metabolic resources of the cave, while there's no sunlight and most of the bacteria are eating rocks, um, do not necessarily, uh, here uh, we have the cave, this is the cave water and this is the surface water. And I have shown here two in, uh, diversity indices. Um, and my hypothesis was that because the sunlight allows things like algae to grow and is, is in general a large energy input, that uh, we would see much higher diversity in the surface water. That would be consistent with uh, the ob observations of many other researchers uh, and very much lower diversity in the bacteria uh, that live in the cave because it's uh, not very rich. But actually, I found that like visibly by the eyeball test, uh, there's a little bit less diversity in the cave water uh, bacterial communities, but it's not, and then these are the cave water bacterial communities. Again, a little bit less diversity, uh, but it's not statistically significant. So actually the metabolic resources of the cave are capable of supporting uh, a large variety uh, of, of different life. Um, and then this is research that's in progress. I've been uh, mapping the different suspected water inputs of the cave. Uh, the surface water inputs I've been looking at are the Rio Benito, as well as um, Eagle's Mouth, which is a, a sinking stream, um, and Government Springs, which is the upwelling from that the sump that is uh, the Crystal Crystal Lake sump, and uh, Turtle Junction, which is sort of in the middle of the cave. And so, what I found so far is that the genetic, if you look at the, if you make a genetic tree of relationships, it matches the hypothesized uh, hydrological connection so far. And I don't want to say that that proves anything. It definitely doesn't. Um, but I was curious from what some of the previous work of Ben Tobin uh, looking at genetic relationships to infer hydrological relationships. Um, and that's that's what inspired me to make this, uh, do this analysis. Um, so baseline measurements. So it's the question four, uh, how can micro, this uh, microbial monitoring occur? So I have a pretty decent idea of the bacteria that live in the cave. And um, we don't really know what that means, I think, <laughs> yet. Um, over the last, of the last three years, I've been able to take samples in two years. Um, and I don't think major uh, karst management changes should be based on microbial community composition alone. But I think it, it does provide an additional dimension of information about the cave that can be used to inform management strategies and see how well they're working. Um, what's next? Uh, I have a lot more analysis to do. Um, the team is going to, uh, including some members of the Fort Stanton Cave Study Project, uh, is going to be collecting more samples actually next week. Um, and we've been culturing some of the manganese bacteria uh, and having the, the communities compete against each other to see um, whether there's an optimized structure. Um, and then over time, uh, we'll also continue to monitor the water that flows across the river to see um, if that changes significantly or if it continues to be stable. So far, it's been stable. There's a ton of people for me to think. Um, this project is part of a larger groundwater study project, but for Fort Stanton, Raymond Arman, Emily Tinkate, John Dunham, uh, and Steve Pierman have, and recently Bron Lipinski have been indispensable. Um, and there's a ton more people for me to thank. Uh, I could not have done it without all of these collaborators. Um, 
and I have uh, current funding sources for the groundwater research as, as a general global thing. Um, and that's all um, I have. Uh, and I suppose I should say, I said that I, uh, that I did some of the uh, analysis. I did do some of the analysis, but all of this is the work of a team, uh, including myself, uh, John Dunham and Raymond Arman and Emily Tim Kate, um, as well as the Fort Stanton Cape Study Project. So um, with that, I'll take any questions. So we did get one question over chat. Jim Loveday asked, Riley, have you heard of HudsonAlpha.org, a genetic research nonprofit? I have not, but I will now look it up. Thank you. Q&A, go. Riley, I want to know about that Calcite River. What, I mean, y'all are obviously stepping on it. So, you know, did it, is it okay to step on it? <laughs> <laughs> And you're on mute, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. I was going to flip back to it, but I'm, I'm struggling. But yeah, so the Calcite River, when they first found it, it was something that no one had ever seen before. And uh, as a result, there was, I think, about two or three years of NASA doing impact studies to figure out whether it was okay to step on it. And there was a wide variety of interesting boot techniques that were designed because people weren't sure how much they had to spread out their weight. Uh, first, they sent the most, the lightest people on the team, which were uh, Kathy Pierman who, and, and, and others who were like uh, a little over 100 pounds. And then they had like these, these large like marshmallow boots to spread out their weight. Um, and after many years of, of those studies, they decided it was okay to step on when it was totally dry. It has to be dry for two weeks. Um, you have to step on it with totally clean everything. You have to roll your bags and there's no dragging of the feet. Um, and periodically there are impact assessments that are done to make sure that the changing stations are where they should be um, and that people are respecting uh, the changing and not dragging any dirt onto the surface of the river. And were those assessments to be, uh, prove that exploration was detrimental very much to the formation, then exploration would not be allowed to continue. So it is it is very much a, a symbiotic relationship. So when the when the river runs, you said it runs every so many years, it's running over that calcite, right? Yeah, so it runs roughly annually, but sometimes it floods for a long time. Um, usually it floods sometime in the late summer or mid fall, and then it will run uh, through the winter, and then if we're lucky, it will be dry by the spring. Uh, and it's running over that calcite, we think, with super saturated calcite water. And um, it's uh, measurable. You can, like, th there have been measurements made of, of the amount that it's deposited every year. It's, it's non-zero. Um, and you can see some areas where things have, um, things have been calcified. So there's human hair that was dropped on the river. And because of the water running over with the super calcified uh, it actually like made that uh, hair into a formation. So the hair is now like a, it looks like a piece of gypsum or something. Um, yeah. That's cool. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Hey Riley, um, great presentation. Thank you for doing this by the way. And uh, I guess two questions, what's on the surface in the drainage of Fort Stanton Cave? Is it undeveloped land? Is there, you know, any development or farms or anything on top that could have an influence? And number two, does the, you know, with the bacteria actually eating the rock, is there ever enough of that to have an, a, an appreciable effect on cave formation at all? Or is it just incredibly, you know, tiny amount? Thank you. Thank you. Um, so yeah, great questions. Uh, thank you for them. So on the surface of Fort Stanton Cave, uh, <laughs> uh, not totally undeveloped. A lot of it's agriculture. There's a number of grazing livestock. One of the things we found in the, the cave water um, was uh, bacteria that was known to exist in cattle lumen. So I do, I do not think it is necessarily pristine water that's all going in there. Um, and then there's also a water treatment plant, um, which we've sampled around uh, to make sure that none of that is sort of uh, excreting contaminants into what known in, uh, inflows to Fort Stanton Cave. So definitely not undeveloped, uh, mostly agriculture, lots of grazing livestock. Uh, in terms of your second question, I don't know. 
Um, I don't think so uh, in terms of, of whether the lithotrophic bacteria affect cave formation. I don't believe so, but I actually, I don't know the answer. Um, I would suspect not, but I would have to get back to you on that one. Fair enough, thank you. Thank you. Any more questions? Going once, going twice. Riley, thank you so much. What an incredible presentation. Thank you. Okay, moving right along. This is one of my favorite parts of the meeting. Now that you've enjoyed a program with Dogwood City Grotto, this is for those of you, maybe this is your first time or your second time, maybe you just submitted an application or you're thinking about submitting an application. Well, it's time to get credit for that. This is introductions time. So no, I hate to interrupt you, but Bob had his hand raised. Oh, well, let's rewind. Bob, please go ahead. Hi, I was applauding. I thought I was applauding. Oh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Carry on. <laughs> All right. Forgot to turn my camera back on. All right. Anyway, uh, let's see. Is now a good time to stop the recording? Do you guys think?